Hey everybody, how's everybody doing? Hope you're all doing well. Happy Thursday to everybody. So uh, today I got a real special treat. So this uh, this guest is someone who um, really helped myself a lot getting back into playing guitar. Uh, as uh, most of you know, there was a long period when, it, when I didn't play guitar and I had to basically teach myself again how to learn. And this was one of the gentlemen that I found on YouTube that in my opinion, I think is one of the best online guitar instructors, hands down. And I was real, very, very honored and pleased that he agreed to come on the show. So with, uh, with no further ado, I welcome Steve Stein. Hey, Steve, how are you, man? I'm good. How are you, buddy? I'm doing awesome, man. I'm doing awesome. Good. So uh, we got uh, a lot of people already in here. So real quick, I just want to pop in and I want to say hello to some of the folks. Absolutely. Because they've been waiting for a while here. Hank Hill is here. Hey, Hank. Hank, how are you? There's uh, Pooh. Welcome, Pooh Ninja. <laughs> Mr. Bruce is in here. Hey, buddy. Uh, Chuck is in here. Zach is in here. Welcome, JP Page 2. How you doing? Fruitcake Tony is in here, uh, which reminds me real quick. Fruitcake Tony was nice enough to send me some guitar picks. I got to show these off. I promised I would show them the, <laughs> show the picks. I don't think you can really see it in the camera, but they do say guitar hack on that side. So I want to thank Fruitcake Tony for sending me the picks, man. You rock. Um, Gary is in here. Mitch Heyman is in here. Welcome. Uh, I'm just going down. Terry Himes is here. Vandy man, welcome. If you guys are new to the channel, uh, much appreciate a thumbs up and uh, be awesome. Uh, Jeff Miller, welcome. Russ is in here. Sandra, welcome. Bearded Blues Dude, how are you? Great Vanzini is here. Merrill J. Rick Romanelli. Well, I got a really great turnout. Thanks, everybody. There's Dave. Jack is in here. Cool. Marco's Images, Brad Miller, Hank Hill, which I've already said. It's okay. <laughs> Rick Hefner. And Janice is in here. Folks, while we're going here, if you've got any questions for uh, for myself or for Steve, I'd probably better yet would be to tag me, and then I can forward those questions over to Steve. And Guitar Meet Science just came in. Awesome. You guys rock. Thank you so much. So, Steve, you've been doing this a long time. And off air, we were talking a lot about uh, about your, your past and where you're coming from. So if you wouldn't mind, let's do that all over again. Absolutely. All right. So. First thing, first question I usually ask is who or or what band in particular individual got you interested in the guitar at first? Um, I always have to default to Ace Frehley from Kiss. <laughs> All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. I, know, I'm, I was born in 1970, so my parents were avid music listeners. My mom listened to a lot of country and a lot of doo-wop, and my dad listened to a lot of rock, a lot of like Alice Cooper and Ted Nugent and Aerosmith and the Beatles and the Stones. Right. So I, I grew up listening to anything and everything. And then when I was about eight, was, was about 78, I was at my cousin's house. We were visiting some relatives of mine right. and he had Love Gun. Uh. And I, I had list, I, well, first of all, I couldn't get, I couldn't stop looking at the album cover. I know it's which, awesome. I mean, and those were great days anyway for albums to be able to, you know, you'd get a new album and it smelled so great and it was just fun to, to look at everything. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so I think if it wasn't for Ace Freely, I probably would have been like a doctor or something like that. <laughs> Ace Freely is to blame for a lot of guitar players, man. Yeah. For sure. That's for sure. Okay. So since you started with Kiss, I got to ask you, what's your favorite Kiss record? Well, for me, honestly, it would probably have to be Kiss Alive too. It, it'd be one of the alive. I mean, Kiss Alive or Kiss Alive Two, but but I think Kiss Alive Two was kind of my awakening, and then I found out about Kiss Alive, right? After Kiss Alive Two. So for me, yeah, I would go with Kiss Alive Two. Yeah, yeah. Well, we can geek out on yeah, Kiss Alive. The, the fourth side, the last side of Kiss Alive Two. Those yes, sides, that's a killer, man. Yes. Killer. Well, I, play, I was just telling you how I play in a bunch of different bands. I play in a B side Kiss band where we play. Rocket Ride, All American Man, um, you know all the songs that those guys don't really normally do, other than maybe the Kiss Cruise or something. Right. That, you know, Room Service, Two Timer. Yes. Yeah, those are the kinds of things that. Oh, those are great. Those are great. You know, I Ace Frehley in the seventies for me, he he was the man. I mean, he was the man. <laughs> I, I love that stuff. So, so when did you first pick up a guitar and 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 try to 
try to learn how to play? Well, to be honest, I, I picked up a guitar when I was nine um, and failed miserably. I had uh, a relative that had borrowed me their acoustic guitar. And if you remember guitars back then, the strings were Six about yeah, 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 yeah. And it was just, and I had a Mel Bay book. And of course, I think one of the reasons why I became a teacher is because you, you don't know what you don't know. I mean, the, the world of guitar is so vast. Mm -hmm. But if you don't know anything, you don't even know where to begin. You don't even understand how a G chord and a C chord can be used in conjunction because you don't understand anything. Right. You're looking at a picture and it tells you what your fingers here, and then you're supposed to strum and a suggested strumming pattern. But it, you know, you're I'm listening to Cat Scratch Fever, and what I'm playing doesn't sound anything. Yeah. In my head, there's no correlation. And um I just it was awful. And so I, I played for a little while and I quit. Well then when I was 13, my parents bought me an electric guitar. And at that time I had rekindled my interest in, in guitar. And we had a local music store here in, in Fargo it, called Schmidt Music. Schmidt Music is, is a popular chain in the upper Midwest. Right. And um, which I would later work at when I got older. But I used to go there and just daydream about guitars all the time. And then my my parents wound up getting to know the manager who again ultimately hired me much, much later. Mm -hmm. And I got a guitar and I started playing and, but this time I had friends that would show me like little Led Zeppelin riffs or, you know, I remember learning, uh, and I had no idea what I was doing, but I could just play that one thing of looks that kill. Right. And, it, but it felt so good. Oh, and, yeah. and so my, my entire perspective on guitar playing was, was upside down from my first one because I wasn't learning from a book. I was learning by what I could hear. And I, I became very, very good at being able to listen to songs on records and figure them out. Yeah. And then, you know, I would just, I, I would learn a whole side of an album. That way I didn't have to keep changing songs. I would just learn, you know, side A of Blizzard of Oz or High and Dry or whatever it might be, you know, right. things like that. That's one thing I think, uh, you know, people of our age that, you know, because of necessity really had to develop was our ears. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Cause there was no, no, no YouTube to show you here's how you play this riff. It's like, you had to learn it by ear. You literally had to find the notes on the guitar. Well, and, and the great thing about that, is it, it creates a, a visual and aural connection on the fretboard. You know, like I remember being, before, you know, long before I knew what the heck I was doing on this thing. But I, I figured out that all the bands that I like to listen to, Judas Priest and Iron Maiden, all these different bands, everybody used this this whole step movement. And I didn't understand what it meant, but it did mean, you know, two frets. You know, even if I went, it had that 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 movement or you know that kind of thing, and so. That's what it meant to me is I could listen to things and I could hear if it was a whole step movement at that. And again, I didn't really know what whole step meant, but I could hear those movements. Right. And if it wasn't that, I could hear, you know, your one, four, five things and, and stuff like that. But uh, Metalhead Hippie is saying Steve has something open. Have him check the compression box. I don't know what he means by that. I don't know if if any. Let me know, folks, if somebody else, anybody else is having issues with the audio, because on my end, it's sounding it's sounding fine. Yeah, and I don't have anything to adjust here, so. Yeah, yeah, no, it, I, I, it seems okay. On my, if, if anyone else is having, or if it sounds fine, let me know in the chat, and I'd appreciate that. Um, all right, so, so you were, ba so, you were taking lessons then early on. Yeah, I started taking lessons. You know, I was probably like fourteen or fifteen. I tried to take. Maybe I was younger than that. I can't really remember, but. Somewhere in the early stages there, I took some lessons and it, it turned out to be a, a less than desirable experience. Like the first, when I first started, yeah, it must have been closer to my, my being 13 because I, I didn't really know how to do much and I took lessons and the teacher I had tried to teach me how to play Dust in the Wind. That was one of the first songs that he tried to teach me how right. to play. And I was so confused because I, I didn't even know chords and I was trying to finger pick and I didn't understand what the, like I didn't know what the C was and and um, it just wound up being a really bad experience. And so I didn't take lessons ever. And then until I went to college, and then of course I majored in, in my, my majored instrument was, was guitar. So, right. um, so I obviously took lessons in, in college when I was younger. I never took any lessons. 
So what were the what were the first uh well, first of all, what was the first guitar? Because you didn't mention what guitar it was. And when, what were the first bands? When did that start happening when you started playing with uh, kids? Um, I didn't really. I, there was a couple of people. I grew up in a trailer court. And there was only there was a couple of people that we would kind of get together and bang on things, but nothing of substance really until I graduated when I was 17 and went to college early. And um, mm -hmm. it was when I got to college that I started jamming with people and started doing the the band scene on the college circuit right and, um and then when i was about i must have been about 19 when i actually started playing in bars and uh okay back then you know you'd you'd have to try out you know we tried out on a sunday sunday afternoon for the bar owner to see if we were enough and we were and then yeah. back in those days you used to play four or five nights a week you know you'd play from tuesday to sunday or wednesday to sunday mm -hmm. and uh you know that so you you join the grind really quick when you're uh, back in those days when you would play a lot. Yeah, yeah. So the what was your first guitar and and what is what was your rig back then? Um my first guitar was a Harmony? No, it was a Hondo. It was a Hondo 2. Oh, Hondo. Okay. Yeah, it was a Hondo and then I got a Harmony a while after that, but it was a Hondo 2 was the first guitar I got less Paul shape. Mm -hmm. Then it wound up being a harmony and SG shape. But, you know, I, I, I didn't have a lot of different guitars and things. I didn't have, we didn't have a lot of money. So what I had was what I had. And I had an old Yamaha 212 amp. I, I couldn't even tell you what, what model it was or anything, just something my parents got off a pawn shop. And that's, that's what I played for quite some time until I got into college. And then I took my student loan money and actually bought my first, Ibanez Jam in 1988. Wow. Uh, yeah, I bought the, the my pink Ibanez Jam. That's great. Well, and what were you using for amplification back then? What was I using for application? Ampli like amps. What, what was your what was your rig when you were out in the bars and, and at 19 when you? Oh gosh, I uh, I, might have I borrowed a lot of amps at that time. I'm trying to think what I would have had. You know, I never had, I didn't have Marshalls and things like that until I was in my mid twenties in the early days. Gosh, I don't even remember. I, in my mind, it seemed like I had a line six, but is that possible back in the early nineties? Uh, lines. I don't know. I don't know. That'd be a good question for the chat. Was line six uh, around the early nineties? Yeah, because I, I honestly don't remember if I had a Line 6 at that time or not. But I would borrow the guitar player in the band I was in in college would borrow me his rig, and it was a Marshall combo that I had. Right. I, I would just play for the shows. Yeah, 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 yeah. So so you you did the gig thing for a while, and then uh, you, you were mentioning that you went to college to study music. So all that was going on at the same time, I would imagine, right? Yeah. So I, 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 well, and when I was going to college, I was doing the gigs on the local scene. So, or on the, the um, college scene. So right. you know, play at various coffee houses and whatever, and, and that sort of thing. Um, the bars didn't come until, well, I suppose it would have been right around that time around or somewhere around 20, you know, the, I had so many things going on all the time in my life that I'm not really sure where each one overlapped because I started teaching guitar lessons when I was like 17 or 18 too. I had my very first guitar student that I would drive out to his house when I got done with school, I would drive out and teach him. Mm -hmm. and then it became two students that I would drive to. And then it was like four students. And then I was like, I can't do this anymore because I'm getting too many students. So, um, as my college career went on, I, w I was playing minimal in terms of bands, but I was doing a lot of teaching. Right, 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 right. So, did you did you did you expand outside the college circuit? Like, what, what was your, your 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 music career? How far did how far were you able? Like, where you did did you guys do any recordings? Did you guys expand outside of that? Well, what happened was when I started playing in, in bars, I started, you know, as most people do, you just, you find some friends that you can play with. And, um, I was playing in a band with some guys that I love. I just don't know that we were very good. Right. And I remember another band coming to see us play that was higher up on the, 
on the ladder, so to speak. And one of the guys said, you know, you're, you're, you're in the wrong band. Um, we would like you to, to play with us. And we don't even need a guitar player because they already had two guitar players at that time. But he's like, we, you, you need to be doing something elevated here. So they, I joined that band and then it just kind of kept going from there. And we would play North Dakota, Minnesota, South Dakota, Montana, Canada, you know, the upper Midwest section there. And um, yeah, so that's where, that's where all of that started. And I would just, the one thing for me from then until about 20 years after that, 25 years after that, right before this guitar zoom thing started, I would never say no to anything. I would never say no to any gig, any opportunity of anything. Cause I kept thinking, man, if I, if I say no, I'm going to miss out on an opportunity. Right. So I, I just, I honestly slept very little and I worked all the time. I just, I worked all the time and um, it's, it's actually a wonder. Well, my wife and I, we've been together for 11 years now, but even back in our early days when we first got together, because we've been together for 16 years, I think. She'll get mad if I don't remember what it is, but I think it's something like that. Yeah. But in our early days, I was never home. You know, we had we had a daughter and I was always gone. I'd see him for a couple hours on Sunday. You know, when I got back from the road, I'd get back at six in the morning and sleep till nine and then up doing it again. So yeah yeah with this with uh when you were in that touring band was it like an originals band no it was all covers it was all covers say eh? mm -hmm. yep yeah because you know original and cover you know i know there's a, there's a war because i've dealt with people all the time with a, a whole original and cover thing for me i always love to play songs like i always love to play that's what i did when i first started playing and i've i've loved to do it ever since um and it was easy to get in and then like for me playing cover songs like um i just did this i don't know if you've seen the video but it, it kind of blew up this video that i did with steve grimmett and nick bocott from grim reaper uh we did a, a remote version of heaven and hell right black sabbath and my approach on the solos for that are kind of the way i approach every song that i play is i don't really learn everything verbatim exactly the way the song is supposed to be I just, kind of learn the structurally what the song should be more or less depending on what the song needs. If you're doing, you know, something that really requires specifics, then of course you have to learn those. Right. Right. Um, but that was always the fun part for me was that I could, when I was on stage, I could inject myself into the things I was, it wasn't just playing songs and trying to get a David Gilmore tone or something. It was just me doing me, you know? Right. 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 That's cool. So that's a, it sounds like a, you got you did a lot of gigging yeah for a number of years for about 15 years it was it was you know out of 52 weeks in a, in a year weekends you know we probably played 35 to 40 of those and uh you know I mean, that was the thing is if you're a musician and you're you're performing you're kind of a punk if you're not out playing every weekend you know but then I had so many other things going on. You know, I, like I told you, I was a Montessori instructor for 14 years. So that was another job I had. And then I had, I, I was a college professor. I did that for five years, uh, teaching guitar studies. At, at so I just, everything, just about, you know, I'd get up at five in the morning. It would just be a sequential bounce of all these different things all day long, even on weekends, seven days a week. It was just, it was just nonstop. And then I finally, and again, it's hard to say exactly when it happened. It was somewhere in my late thirties though. I, I could feel myself crashing. Like I just had may, maybe mid thirties, something like that. Right. But I could feel my energy was rolling off. Like I had, I was, I was running out of energy. I was running out of steam and I had 75 irons in the fire. And, um, and then all of a sudden guitar zoom happened. And because at that time, what I, I finally thought in my head well, this internet thing might be a real thing, right? This YouTube right. might be a big deal. And uh, so I thought, well, what if I find a way to get online and teach a guitar class where I'm teaching 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 people in an hour instead right. of two students, one student for 30 minutes each? And I could actually make more money in that hour. And then I could actually have like three hours off to myself to actually say hi to my daughter and my, my wife yeah and yeah that's where this thing started and then the owner of guitar zoom dan denley found me 
on on YouTube and got a hold of me and the rest is kind of history from there. All right, good. Well, actually, that, that hits upon a couple of questions, which uh, Bruce is asking, Steve, how did you figure out your teaching method? I never thought about it. I, 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 I started teaching, and I don't even remember how I got that first student, but I still talk to him every once in a while. But I think I was just always really good at explaining things. Like even even in even in high school, you know, even you know, talking to people about math or social studies or whatever it was, I think I was always just really good at at breaking things down and explaining things. Right. Um, and the one thing that I always tried to make sure of with my guitar playing was that my guitar playing, my guitar ability needed to stay in check away from my ability to teach. I wasn't there to show off to a student or to sit and noodle for 20 minutes in their guitar lesson. My job was to try and motivate them and get them excited about playing and wanting to go home and practice. And, and it was easier in the early years, it seemed like, in the last years of, of my private lessons before I started doing what I'm doing now, it seemed like you had to try so hard to get people to want to go home and play because the guitar was kind of like n kids just weren't really into it unless their parents were into it like mine. You know, kids weren't really wanting to learn how to play and nobody really wanted to spend the time because it took so much time. Yeah. And when you're a, a teacher, which we were talking about too, yeah. and you really care and you really want your kids to succeed and not just kids, but, but students in general, right? It's a, it takes a lot of energy. Like, and it's just nonstop, you know, you teach for eight hours, you got 16 students and it's just nonstop. And I think what happened at the end there is I was just, I was just out of energy for myself. I was out of gen energy for my family and, and, right. Right. and you don't want to be a teacher if you're not, if you're not doing everything. So this conversion to doing this online has been really great for me because um, my time isn't obligated to one student, one student, one student, one student. My time now is, Here's a here's something that I think people could benefit from. Here's something that I'm going to make and put out on social media or a guitar course or whatever it might be, and um, and it, it will help somebody. And then I don't have to be present forever for that idea. I can make that video and it can exist out there and people can benefit. And if that video didn't make sense or didn't help them, I can make another video and then that one can help somebody. And that's what I've been doing ever since. Right, right. Uh, so Don's got a question. Uh, he's asking, at what point did Steve realize he was good or when did he get it? Um, when I was a, when I was a teenager, I knew that I could play metal. I mean, that's that's what I grew up playing, you know, Ozzy and all that kind of stuff. So I knew I could play that genre quite well, but I didn't have any improvisation skills early on because mm -hmm. I, again, I, I didn't know what I didn't know. Right. 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 I had no idea of how scales worked and all that sort of thing. I was just really good at playing songs. And it wasn't until I got into college that I really started exploring theory and practicing a ton, like rudimentary elements that, that I had lessons with, with my uh, professor in college. And then I think I think that's where it really kind of took off. But to be honest with you, I still have epiphanies on a regular basis with my playing where like in the early days, I, I would say that I was far more focused on technique and speed and all that kind of stuff because of the music I listened to. And I really missed out on a lot of the melodic playing like, mm -hmm. you know, Neil Schoen or Steve Lukather or, you know, my friend Tim Pierce, if you know who Tim is, like I get together with Tim and I just love listening to him play, like we'll jam. And um, I just, he's, he, you know, he's not trying to go for anything that he can't do. He's, he's right in his comfort zone, but he, he has such a melodic sense about him. And so, you know, the last, I would say five or 10 years have really been focusing on, you know, I play metal all the time. I play with bands and things like that, but my craft keeps growing in, in those ways. So I don't think it, you know, I would be the last person to say I get anything like I'm, but, but I, I think I was able to hold my own because I gained confidence. Like anybody who's listening to this right now, one of the biggest things you have to, one of the biggest, you know, mountains you have to, to cross is learning to gain confidence in yourself and stop worrying about 
what the latest greatest guitar player is doing because you know i always i always use this, this analogy it's like a farmer that is going to plant something so he tills the 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 ground and he plants it and then the next day he goes out and tills it again and then he plants and then he goes out and tills it, tills it again. And the problem is there's never a chance for it to grow. It just keeps dying because you just keep redoing it. And I think that's the problem that we have a lot of times as guitar players. Is we're just too busy worrying about what everybody else is doing and trying to learn the next biggest thing as opposed to going, well, what do I wish I was doing? Like, what do I really like? You know, whether it's a cover band, whether it's original band, whether it's soloing, whether it's writing, whether it's singing, whether it's, I mean, it could be a million different things. Yeah. Uh, Mitch Heyman uh, is asking, uh, can you ask Steve, how old was his oldest student he's ever had? Oh gosh. I've had, I've had eighties. 80. I've taught, wow. I've taught, I've taught blind students. I've taught oh. deaf students. I've taught, I've taught, I've taught, I, the, I think the youngest student that I had was like five but you know when they get really young it's really hard unless they're really driven you right. know yeah. um, but i've had students that have, have have been that way before um yeah so it just you know you just meet the whole thing with guitar education if you're a teacher if anybody's a teacher out there you just have to meet every single student where they are so i never taught with books or any materials it was just come in and sit down tell me about you tell me what you like tell me what you don't like Tell me what you wish you were doing. What does the instrument mean to you? Like if you say, well, I'm just here because my parents want me to be here. Okay, well, how can we make the best out of that? Yeah. If it means we're learning, you know, Old Town Road. Okay, well, that's fine. We can do anything as long as it inspires that student to go home and want to pick up the guitar, you know? Yeah, exactly. Uh, here's a really good question. Uh, Dave is asking, hey, Steve, what would you say is the biggest, uh, the biggest key to learning how to improvise? I think the biggest key to learning how to improvise, there's, there's a couple of parts to it. Number one is, is you've got to learn to visualize your fretboard. Okay. You can practice, you know, playing up and down and think of it this way. Improvisation is not really improvisation. Improvisation is regurgitation of ideas that you've already done before. You just don't know what order they're going to come out. It's not like you just grab this guitar and you're going to play it like this and it all is going to work out you know, in a random series of notes and numbers and all these things, it doesn't really work that way. It's repetition. And those repetitional ideas get kind of sent out of your fingers, but you're not sure in what order. Mm -hmm. so, so practice things like, and you're developing technique. That's wonderful. And you absolutely should do that. But just because you know how to play up and down the scale, doesn't mean you're actually making music with the scale, right? Mm -hmm. What you've got to learn how to do, take that scale then and figure out how to manipulate different ways of making it sound more musical because if you just play it up and down it just sounds like notes right right then it begins to sound more like a singer right so then if i take that idea and i i have a technique you can view on youtube called meandering and what yeah. i get people to do meandering is when you take a, a metronome or something like that and you set it at a comfortable speed because you got to figure out what speed it is but let's say you've got it set it here so what you do is you go into whatever it is you're working on let's say it's this a minor pentatonic right here and you're going to play this meandering thing what meandering means is you're going to move randomly through this first position of pentatonic or whatever it is you're working with you're, you got to move random though. You can't just play it up and down. Okay. You're going to move. I call it brainless and I don't mean it negatively, but you're not trying to build anything. You're just trying to improvise. You're just letting the notes fly out. And what you do is you don't stop. So when, the, when this is going, I'm going to use So I'm going to go bump, 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 bump. So I'm going like this. And you try and free yourself from the restraints of just thinking about playing it up and down, up and down. And you start learning how to jump around, which obviously you must have done this because I, I saw you nod at your head. Yes. So, well, the me I remember the meandering thing as soon as you mentioned it. I, yeah. 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 It works. 
works really well because here's the deal. So think about it. So once I learn how to meander, let's say I take my second position of A minor pentatonic and I meander there as well. So I'm going. You see, so now what I'm doing is I'm combining two positions together, gaining confidence in my ability to meander aimlessly, brainlessly through these two positions, right? Mm -hmm. So then what happens next is as I, and, and again, you gotta give this time, like, yes, you can increase your tempo speeds, right? You can increase your metronome. Absolutely, you can do that. But the, the, the thing you have to remember about guitar playing is it's not just getting to the end of something and then going on to something else. Everything that you learn can continually be cultivated and get better. Right. So as I'm doing this meandering thing, then what I do, maybe I increase my speed. Well, what I do next is I start chopping it into pieces. So now all of a sudden, instead of playing it without stopping, I just put pauses in different places. And it begins to sound more like real music. Yeah, you know, you're free. Yeah, and if I add in the human elements, which are bending, vibrato, slides, hammer ons, pull offs. All of a sudden, it begins to sound more and more like real music and not just going. Yeah. Uh, this is a, something we actually talked about uh, before we, we, we went live. Vandy Man is asking, uh, what is it like to know uh, that you've influenced hundreds of thousands of students? Um, well, I made a commitment a long time ago that with my with my kids, especially that I would always try and do the best I can to do the best I can. You know, I'm not out here trying to be famous or trying to impress anybody or it's just what I'm good at. And so I am absolutely honored that I have the ability to do what I do. I believe me, I wake up every day very, very aware and blessed at my career because yeah, I love doing what I do. Yeah, so. you, you, if you if you if you like what you're doing, that's that's a major blessing in itself. Uh, Metalhead Hippies asking what you think of Tosh Ferrant and other young players like Philippa Q. Arendt. I don't know that person, but I know Ferrant is. You know, th there was a time when it looked like guitar was kind of dying. And I think the reason it looked that way is people were just looking in the wrong place. There are so many new, incredible guitar players out there. There's so, and there always has been. Okay. It's just with, without social media, we didn't know it. Like it seemed like in the nineties and the two thousands, and you could pick on the eighties too, even though I look this way, it, it seemed like things were pretty stagnant. Mm -hmm. But they weren't. There was all kinds of things going on behind the scene. We just couldn't see it. Now, because of Instagram and, and YouTube and Facebook and those sorts of things, we can see them. Like, uh, I'm sure many of you know who, like, Mateus Asado is. Like, I yeah, I can't say enough about his plan. And there's, there's a million people I could name. But I just, I think that's so amazing. Um, you know, the guys from Polyphia, you know. Um, there's just, there's so many great players out there. So that's the beauty is that these, all these players have been practicing. All these players have been honing their own chops and mm -hmm. building a new direction to go. And um, that's great. That's, you know, my job is to inspire on this side and uh, their job is to inspire on that side. So that's cool. Uh, Braxel, it's going a little technical here. He goes, how does Steve make up a chord progression? Let's say out of D Lydian. Well, Delivery and the big thing is that you got your sharp four, right? So if you're playing in So if you were making up something, the first thing you'd want to do, like I don't just make a usually just play chords. Like for me, things are mostly based off of So that's something I could do to make something sound delidian, right? right. But mostly, I mean, most of the riffs I come up with are always based on. Of... You know, mostly it's pretty heavy stuff, drop tuned, that sort of thing. Those are things that I really love to to jam to. I love drop tuning for some reason. Just always reminds me of like King's X. If you listen to King's X, like yeah. cool, 
drop King's X stuff. I just love that kind of stuff. Uh, Chuck is asking, ask Steve about his number one, your guitar. And he likes your, he likes that Ibanez. My number one guitar? Well, it probably would be this one. To be honest with you, I've had a lot of a lot of mileage with this guitar. This was has gone on the road with me um, overseas as well. So I I uh, I would say this. I have a lot of guitars that I really like. I still have that guitar from 1987 or 88, whatever it was, that first Ibanez that I bought, which is what I had last night when you and I got together. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I love that guitar too. But I think this would probably be my favorite. But there's there's different ones for different reasons. Like I own some Paul Reed Smith ones that I really like, but I've always been an Ibanez guy. You know, I, I mean, for me, if I'm going to go on stage, it's going to be one of these gems and maybe someday it'll become something else. But right now for my, my brain, I'm a little OCD. So for me, it's got to be something that's really home. Cool. That's your home. Yeah. I want to thank Hank Hill. Thank you so much for the super chat. And uh, Hank doesn't have a question. Hank, throw in a question, man. You gave us a super chat, throw in a question. Much appreciated. All right, so let's get into the whole guitar zoom thing. We haven't really talked about that. So you were you were approached by Dan. So at that point, you were just doing stuff on your own online. And then how did uh, so? I'm assuming Dan found you through. Yeah. So I I uh, I had started doing. You know, I had tried this online thing, trying, and basically in the early days of the internet, I what I basically tried to do is I would go to every educational music educational site I could find and I would put my name in as a teacher. Right. I can't remember where it all was, but just anywhere where I could get my name out there. I didn't know anything about internet marketing, digital marketing. I, I knew nothing about anything. Mm -hmm. but I just thought if I could put my name in enough baskets, maybe something would work. And um, there was a company called Lesson Face out of New York that um, I'm actually going to be doing something with them next month uh, as a free thing for beginner, beginning guitar players. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, I haven't talked to them in a long time, but they hired me to do some classes, like I told you earlier. So I started doing some classes with them on Saturdays where I could, you know, teach. And there was like 20 people in the class or whatever. And, right. you know, the interface was very archaic back then in terms of doing web in the speed of the internet and it was just it was it was you know it wasn't optimal at that time and uh i remember going on lunch break at the montessori school and i got a phone call and it was dan from guitar zoom and he's like hey you don't know me but i saw a couple of your videos because i put a couple of really awful videos and i think they're still up somewhere but i didn't know anything about making videos and i played like a pink floyd song or something like that. and he goes hey i'd like to talk to you about maybe doing some content for my company guitar zoom. Cause at that time, Dan was teaching all the guitar stuff. Mm -hmm. so again, I never said no to anything. I'm like, sure. And so I started making videos, guitar courses for him. And I would do these at night when I got home, like 10 at night to like six in the morning, I yeah. would do a guitar video while everybody was sleeping. And then I'd get up and start again. So I wouldn't get a lot of sleep when I was doing those guitar courses, but I could bang out a guitar course in a couple of days. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, our friendship and our business relationship kept getting better and, and we get to know each other a little more. And finally, he offered me a full-time career because he goes, dude, you, he goes, I, I, I think you're a great guy. And he goes, you're going to kill yourself working less much. And what I'd love to do for you is, is if we can ever get this, this company to a place where I could pay you, I'd love to pay you what you're making with everything else that you're doing. Wow. You promise me that you wouldn't just go right back to that. So mm. it was at that time that I really had to, I said, you, you know, we had to work it out. It took like almost a year before we finally got to a place where he goes, look, we're going to try it. We may sink this company, but we're going to try it and see if, if we can pay you. And uh, that was the first time in my life. And this would have been in my thirties, somewhere around there, mid thirties when I, I started working for guitar zoom that I had free time. And I'm not even kidding. You. First wow. time, my wife was actually freaked out because she's like, I, she always tells the story that she didn't even know how it was going to be for us, like whether or not we'd actually get along because she was used to <laughs> never being home. So, funny. Yeah. Okay, we've got a couple of questions. Uh, Dave's asking, Steve, do you ever find yourself in a guitar funk where you don't want to pick, pick one up? How do you break that funk? What I do all the time, I find myself in funks. What I do is I try not to follow 
a traditional rudimentary practice like I used to when I was younger. Like I would lose my mind if if I was practicing technique and it wasn't going the way it was supposed to that day. Mm-hmm. I would I would be angry at the world. I've learned not to be that guy anymore. What I do now is I just go with flow. Like if I'm not feeling like technique that day, I go with creativity. If I'm not feeling like creativity that day, I'll go with a tune. I'll just learn something fun for the fun of it. Right, right. Or, you know, even have an inspiring conversation with a musician friend. But you can't just do this. You know, the problem is, is we get into these, these, and again, don't get me wrong. If whatever you're doing is working for you, it's working for you. It's okay. Mm. But if it's not working for you, what you got to do is look at yourself and go, well, what is it that I need? And oftentimes what we, what we need from the guitar perspective is motivation. We need enjoyment because we're so locked into, you know, yeah. Sing the same things over and over. And those can be inspiring. Don't get me wrong. I mean, you might be on a roll and you're going, holy crap, this is great. But yeah. there are other times you're like, it's just not working for me. So what do I need to do? Well, sometimes it's going to a show or watching a concert on on your TV, you know, or, or something like that. Or just yeah. songs like during this COVID thing, one thing that's been really fun for me that I haven't done in a long time is doing all these collaborations with other musicians mm-hmm. all around the world. Like somebody will call me and go, hey, we should do Fight the Good Fight by Triumph. And I'm like, holy crap, I've heard this song a long time. Well, that's one of the ones that I'm working on right now. Right. Um, you know, I've probably got 10, 12 collaborations right now that are in the fire waiting to, to get done. And um, so it's kept me really busy because that's a lot of work on my end. But it's a lot of fun because you, you just go back and all of a sudden you'll get, you know, the drummer's drum part, the other guitar player's guitar yeah. part. Parts. You put them together, you're like, wow, this sounds really cool. So you, yeah. you gotta break out of the box and not just do the same things all the time. Uh, Broxel is asking, does Steve like the new Steve Ipia? I, I got to play it at NAM this year in California, and I really liked it. I'm not gonna get one though. Um, what you know, I've I've become here's the deal is I've become so associated with these these gems. Because I, like I told you before, for the longest time, I just never had any room. So what I owned was what I played. And I was never the guy that owned 20, 30, 40 guitars. You know, I owned a couple of guitars and that's what I had. And um, so it just happened to work out that the gems were the way I went when I was 17 or whatever it was, 18. And it just, I just kind of kept going that way. It, you know, I didn't, you know, I owned a, a Les Paul at one point and I sold it and you know, I was never a strat guy because I knew I was more of a humbucker kind of player. Right. And um, but the Pia plays great. Don't get me wrong. If you like gems, the Pia is amazing. It it plays amazing. Mm. Um, I'm just kind of on the search now for some other things. Like, you know, just recently I got a premium for my Mez and some other things. I got an Axion. Just trying different different styles of guitars. What I've always loved about the gem, and the Pia feels the same way. Is the neck is so thin. The neck is so thin. And I saw somebody in the chat had mentioned something about uh, setting up my strings, but my strings are, are really close to my neck. So mm-hmm. I play with, you know, feather light pressure with my hand, kind of this, the Joe Satriani kind of way of playing. Right. And um, I've never been let down on the gems and the Pia really, honestly, you pick it up and you just go, wow, it, it plays, it plays like a gem. It just looks a little different. So, uh, Laz, uh, thanks so much, Laz, for the super chat. He's just making content here. He says, hey, Steve, you were one of the first YouTubers I found. Awesome stuff, man, and the coolest dude. How do I teach Roxy guitar? Roxy is his bird. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. That I've never done before. That's <laughs> tricky. Really tricky. Uh, Gary's asking, has Steve ever done any Floyd Rose-inspired lessons, whammy bar training, if you will? Not really. I Floyd is a friend of mine, but I don't, I don't, as a matter of fact, I got a Floyd Rose guitar sitting over there right now. Um, but I, I don't, you know, for me, the Floyd has always been. That's kind of the extent of what the Floyd does for me, but it's very much a part of my vibrato. Right. Um, you know, but I don't do a lot, you know, every once in a while for cool effects, you know, the, you know, that kind of stuff and things like yeah. that um, when you're on stage and stuff. But those are, those are kind of it for me. You know, you'll notice that my, my, my tremolo arm 
is really loose. Like I've never been that player that can tighten those up. I need it out of the way when I don't need it because I don't need it 90% of the time. Right, right, but right. I really, you know, it's always that kind of stuff. You know, and then I can drop it and it's out of the way and I can keep going. Yeah. So, you know, I, that, that's kind of the extent of what I do with the, the whammy. But when it's not there, I really, really, really miss it. Yeah. Uh, Fruitcake Tony's asking, uh, is it your experience that Guitar Hero, the video game, uh, that uh, video games have replaced real guitars for kids? Well, I don't, you know, the, now is I don't. I think it might have for a little while, and it, it was good and bad because the, the good thing about Guitar Hero back when that rock band and those things were really popular is it got people interested in wanting to play guitar. Not everybody, but I certainly saw people that came in and said, you know, I'd say, well, what makes you want to play? Well, I own Guitar Hero, and I'd love to learn how to play. So I, I think there was benefit. I know that there's a new one. Maybe somebody knows what it's called, but there's a new one that's actually kind of educational. Oh, the, you're talking about the musician thing. No, not musician. There's another one that uses like an actual kind of guitar. Oh, okay. I'm not familiar with that one. Yeah, I'm not sure what it is, either, but I know Rocksmith. There it is. Oh, Rock Rocksmith. Okay. And I don't have any experience with that. By the time Rocksmith came out, I wasn't doing the the private lessons anymore. But you know, I think whatever gets you there. It's just kids nowadays. You know, for you and I, it was different because we were at that age when Guitar Heroes, it was larger than life. Stadiums yeah. and all this stuff was larger than life. Mm -hmm. For them, you know, video games are where they, they live. TikTok is where they live. You know what I mean? 30-second videos is where they live. Um, but again, if you look at guys like Mateus, they're not all like that. I mean, there's people out there that are, have found excitement in playing. So I think the, the video games are are bad. Um I just don't know that much of that exists anymore other than Rocksmith. Has anybody here tried Rocksmith? Because I'd love to hear if, if if it seemed like it helped you. So yeah, I'll keep an eye on the chat for that. By the way, folks, if you've got questions for Steve, please tag me at Guitar Hack so I can see them. Uh, Jason Metahevic has a question for you. Steve, what is your current live rig? My current yeah. live rig, actually, um, I've got two different ones. I've got a Mezza Barba, if you know Mezza Barba, Pier Angelo from Italian. It yeah. Yeah. Amazing rig. I've got an M zero that I just love. Um, it's funny because I have next week I'll have Howie Simon on. Oh, wow. Nice. Yeah. And Howie Simon is a Mets, a barber guy. Yeah. That's it's, cool. they're, they're great amps and, and yeah. your Angel is a great guy and he takes pride in those amps. Um, I met him three years ago at NAM and played a, an M zero and had to have one. So as soon as Nam was over, I got a hold of it and got a got an M zero. But so that's one of my live rigs. But I don't use it in the studio because it, you know the power soak and all that. I tried all that stuff, you know. And again, that's a whole other you know topic of discussion is gear. Oh yeah. Studio. But but I haven't made that transition. It works great for live. It wants to be loud. It's a beast. And um, and then the other thing is is I use Kemper. I use Kemper's live. Um, Kemper has become an invaluable tool for me um, in the studio and live. And then the other one is I've got um, the Black Spirit 200 by Hughes and Kettner. Oh, okay. That, yeah. live a lot too. I used to use it in the studio a lot, but now it's sitting at my rehearsal space and we haven't been able to practice for a while. But um, so I have that in the rehearsal space. So, but you, any, of, any of those three, if I need massive versatility, I go with the Kemper. If I need clean and grunt and rock and whatever i tend to go with the hughes and kettner and if i if i need full-on tube heavy i go with i go with the mezzo barba not that the other two can't do those things it's just that's kind of the way i work right right uh don is uh julie okay julie uh is asking steve do any of your kids uh want to play guitar as well well i have a 19 year old and i have an 11 year old and my 19 year old does play strumming and courting things right you know she's she's 19 so she grew up in the height of taylor swift and then later ed sheeran and all that kind of stuff she grew up with the singer songwriter um performers of that era and so guitar to her isn't willy willy it is she could care less about that sort of thing right right um, so and she's got an amazing voice so she and i do shows where i play acoustic and she sings 
and she might strum or, or something like that. Um, she plays piano quite well, mm -hmm. but you know, guitar, I just never pushed it on because like in the early days with my, my oldest daughter, I would, I, you know, I've taught relatives before, but when I teach my teaching hat would go on and my dad hat would go away. Yeah. And, you know, and then you'd have to be like, well, did you practice last night? Well, did you practice today? Right. And yeah. after a while, you know, I'm teaching 500 other kids and then I'm teaching my daughter and, you know, it just got to be a conflict of interest. So I'm like, no, 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 I, I can't do this anymore. So she, but no, she, she plays. My youngest is more, they, they both grew up yeah. dancing. My youngest still does dancing. Um, but she hasn't really made the, she doesn't, have, I always tell people with guitar, you have to practice on the days that you eat. That's always my thing. I tell every one of my students, right. she's not ready to do that. She would like to practice once a week and be good at it, but you really can't do that. No, no. Here's a really interesting question. And I, I, you know, and I think it applies to a lot of us because we're of a certain age that usually watch my channel. Uh, have you ever seen older guitarists? This is a, a crawl bar, by the way, is asking this. Have you ever seen older guitarists show drastic improvement with practice from no alternate picking technique to ripping technique, or is this learning reserved for our younger years? Well, I, I think it has to do with how much time you have and the direction that you find yourself with that time. You know, you think of guys like, I, I think of like Mark Tremonti. Now, it's not like he was old, but Mark Tremonti making his transfer from Creed to now is like night and day, you mm -hmm. know, Aldridge, like he became not that he wasn't good before, but he became really freaking good. And then you look at players like um, Glenn Tipton is always one of the ones I go to like mm -hmm. Glenn Tipton from Judas Priest was a regular seventies kind of guitar player, but then yeah. pain yeah. comes out and he's freaking yeah. just insane, you know, yeah. just, <laughs> just insane. Yeah. So, it, it absolutely can be done. It's just, I think the difference is, is that when you're younger, you have more free time to just spill into mm -hmm. practicing and, you, you know, perform. Like for me, it's not just practice. Like you got to get in the ring. Like one thing that I think is really important is you got to get together with other people. You got to play. Exactly. You know, bring, bring the game up to a real level. And it's okay if you don't. I'm just saying, if you want to reach those levels, you, you've got to get together with other people. And then you get on stage and you start realizing, I remember being a kid and getting on stage and having no idea what the heck I was supposed to do, like feeling very awkward with my body. Cause I didn't know. Right. You know, now, you know, I'm, I headbang the entire time and you're running around and jumping in the audience and like, and it's just an instinct. It's just, just that's the fun. Of it. Yeah. I, I, a lot. I think a lot, if you have the ability, like you say, to play with other people, I think that is such a catalyst in your, in your learning. You know, it because practicing at home is one thing, but then when you're when you're practicing with the band and then it's time for your solo, you know, just to get over that hump where you're not gonna freeze and lock up, where you're you're gonna execute it. Right. Well, that goes back to that same thing. You're absolutely right, where just because you learn how to play certain things really well doesn't mean it's gonna translate in the real world. If if you don't if, you, if your goal is never to worry about the real world, then it doesn't really matter. matter. But learning to interact with a band and be able to play the right thing at the right time, the right way, whatever that means, that takes practice. And, um, you know, I, the, one of the first things people always say when I, when I meet people in terms of guitar lessons is, well, I don't want to be really good or I don't want to play on stage or, and I always say, are you sure? Like, do you have to start off with that? Because I understand you're putting up the wall and saying, but, but the truth is, I think most of us really would love to do that. And once you do it, it's, um, it's hard to not want to do that again, you know? So, but you've got to, you've got to get confident with that environment too, which is entirely different than just practicing scales or theory or whatever it might be. Um, Andy Dion is asking your favorite key slash mode to write riffs in right now. When I write riffs, I don't really think about them in terms of a key, to be honest with you. I think about what they sound like. Mm -hmm. I think that growing up, I, I don't really sit and go, well, this should be in Lydian or this should, I don't, that's not even really on my, on my radar. I just, I just try and, if, if I'm feeling more mellow or feeling more rock or feeling more, you know, heavy, I kind of, I 
grab the right guitar and go, okay, I'm going to do a seven string thing, or I'm going to do a drop tune thing, or I'm going to do a classic rock thing. And then I just start kind of making things up. So I don't really think in terms of those that comes afterwards when I'm trying to write a melody or maybe a solo over the top or something like that. Yeah. When, when yeah. I, I really don't, I really don't start with a theoretical concept. I start with the, the sound. Uh, here's uh, Martin LaBelle, you know, who's uh, new to the channel. Welcome. Uh, hey, Steve, you work with bootlegger guitars for the Royal model. Any other collaborations coming up? Well, not right now. Um, bootlegger, you know, the uh, unfortunately, the, the guy that I was working with, his name is Steve Paulson. He just passed away last week um, from cancer. So Steve had approached me. Steve and Chuck, who owns the company, had approached me about... Um, helping them design a guitar. And um, so we decided we wanted to design something that would be great for a beginner slash intermediate player where it's the cost isn't outrageous. And um, so it's not like a signature guitar or anything. It was just something that we really wanted to come up with. What were the, the best things that, that Steve wanted or I wanted in a guitar? And then we would come to a kind of an agreement there. And then, and then that's where the Royal came out of that. So um, right now I getting involved with companies and things like that is, is, is more time consuming than you might think. Mm -hmm. and, um, that's not a bad thing. It's just right now, I just, my time is so limited that I'm not, you know, worrying about designing anything or, you know, I have endorsements with companies, but the endorsements I have are pretty low key. Like they don't ask for much from me. Um, right. You know, like Ibanez is, an, I'm endorsed by Ibanez, which is just a godsend for me because I play them anyway. You know, yeah. Yeah. But they don't they don't say, well, you can't play anything else and you're all you know, there's no there's no rules like that. They're just we're just glad to be affiliated with each other. So oh, that's cool. Yeah. Uh, uh, BB Made is asking, does Steve have any connection to the band Power Mad? I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't always know where everybody is from. I'm I'm very familiar with Power Mad, but I, I don't know that I know anybody from that band. Okay. Um, is here's another question from Broxel and welcome Broxel. Is Steve's pick of choice still Hawk? Yep. I love these picks. I I bumped them up. Now I'm at a 2.0, which is what I used to use when I first moved over to using Hawk picks. I'm using a 1.6 millimeter. Um, but I had Rob make me some 2.0 ones, and um, and I'm right back to comfort zone. So 2.0. Yep. Yeah. What do you use? I use these. <laughs> do, do you know what? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what those are. Do What's you know that? what thickness they are? Pardon me? Do you know what thickness they are? Um, It's probably under a one mil. Okay, so they're pretty thin. But you can adjust the, the, the thickness of them by moving them in and out because they have the rubber on the end that's kind of flexible. If you can oh, see. I see. Okay. So that's what I like about them. I mean, if you want to just pick real quick, you just pinch them really tight. And they don't flex. And then if you want to strum, you just, yeah. Um, sure. I've been on these for like, th shit, three years now. Absolutely. Yeah, right. Well, and I was like so many shredders. I was I was jazz three. I lived and died by jazz threes. I, that's what, I went from jazz three to this. <laughs> there you go. So I yeah. went from jazz threes to the, the um, John Petrucci picks which are like jazz threes, but they're bigger. Okay. And, I, and I'm a little guy. I'm only five foot two. So my hands are, are quite small, but I, I found that that bigger guitar pick and I used jazz threes literally for it for 10 years. Yeah. I, I moved to those Petrucci's and I like the fact that they were a little bit bigger, but I would wear out the, the, the tips of those picks so fast. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so that's when I, I had found out from a friend of mine about Hawk picks and I got a hold of Rob because he said they lasted forever. And so I, I got some of these picks and, and um, yeah, I, I go through tips of guitar picks very, very a couple of days. I can wear out of the oh, tip. Wow. Of pick. Oh yeah. So. Um, so Hank Hill is asking uh, that you, so Steve mentioned Polyphia earlier. Are they his favorite Ibanez artist? If not, who is? Well, to be honest, I think my favorite artist would either be Steve Vai or Satriani or for sure, one of my absolute favorite guitar players of of ever is Andy Timmons. So oh, yeah, yeah. So those would be those would be my top guys. With Polyphia, it's not that I'm such a big Polyphia fan. Mm -hmm. I'm a fan of what they do. 
I'm not really that big of a fan of listening to them. It's mm -hmm. not really my thing, but I love the fact that they're so young and so good. It yeah. just makes me feel so good that there's, you know, people that are more than younger than half my age that are out there just doing something so unique and so creative and inspiring so many people. That's what I think is so important. Um, yeah, I don't really sit around listening to them that much, but it's not, again, I don't have anything against it. It's just not really my thing, but as players, um, I just, I'm so glad that, that there's a, there's a younger generation like that, that are so good at what they do. Yeah. So, um, let me just mention, I've, uh, for those of you that are not familiar with Steve Stein um, and you'd like to uh, check out his channel, I have the link below. I also have uh, Steve's link up in the cards. Um, and I'm just going to let you know, Steve, we've been at an hour. I don't know what your, your window's like. I, if you want to go a little longer, that's fine. It's entirely up to you. Yeah, we, let's, let's make it less than 10 more minutes and then we're good. Okay, great. Because there's still some questions coming up. Go uh, over ten minutes, and we're good. By the way, there's 81 people watching right now. Awesome. Yeah. So uh, we got a really good turnout today. Um, so here's the next question. This is from Braxel. Has Steve tried Gravity Picks? And Petrucci has the red thicker picks that I use, but they wear down easily. So I think that's what you're referring to. That's right. So have you tried the Gravity Picks? I haven't. I haven't tried those. You know, I live in North Dakota, and which kind of defines my journey on in terms of gear because because it's a smaller community we didn't have access to all the latest and greatest mm. smaller companies you know we had Fender and we had Gibson and yeah. primarily and and even certainly Ibanez although you know in the later years I had to you know move out into going to Ibanez directly or whatever it might be to uh to acquire some of the stuff. But so, so a lot of those things, as much as I'd love to try them, unless I contact the company. Um, and I'm, I'm telling you right now, what, what makes my life so easy is that I'm really s simple when it comes to gear. Like I'm, I'm not on a constant quest for new stuff. Once I find something that works, you're good. I'm good. Yeah. 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 Um, metalhead hippie is, uh, saying, Steve, how did it feel to be part of rocking 1000? And it was awesome. Any pet peeves, anything, things that drive you nuts. About the Rockin' 1000 or just in general? In general, yeah. Um, the Rockin' 1000 was amazing, and the guys that run it were just absolutely incredible. It was cool to see the whole thing uh, come together. Any pet peeves that I have, I guess my, my biggest pet peeve would probably be excuses. You know, that, that would be my biggest thing. Not everybody has to practice guitar eight hours a day. And I could care less whether you practice 20 minutes a day. If you're having fun, that's all that matters. But you, you have to be realistic with your situation and what it is you want out of it, whether it's guitar playing, whether it's your career, whether it's whatever it is, you, you got to, you know, people just have to stop procrastinating and figure out how to do what they want to do. It doesn't always work out. And I know it's easy for me to say that cause I get to do what I do, but it's not like my life has been easy. I worked my butt off to, 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 to be able to do what I do right now. And I've sacrificed a lot of things in the process. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's it. It's just, you, you gotta, you gotta find a way to be happy and not worry about what everybody else is doing and don't waste your life away. You know, I watched my dad pass away, he passed away a couple of years ago when it was, it was a really, traumatic experience to be there for that whole thing and it made me realize that that time is just really short our time is really short yeah and uh you know you don't just want to waste it you you want to enjoy yourself so yeah exactly um andy Dion is asking steve how was tim pierce when you jammed with him well i've jammed with tim many times tim is a super quiet person um but when you get to know him, he's he's an amazing guy and he's amazingly talented. And there are times that I absolutely can keep up with him and I'm feeling good. And there are times that I play with him and go, you know how it is when you have a certain chord progression and you're feeling it and everything's there. And then yeah. every once in a while you'll get a tempo or a chord progression or a groove or something. Well, and, fine, yeah. and it won't be there. You know, <laughs> that guy's got such history doing what he does. And he's so comfortable. He's he's a prime example. He's just comfortable in his skin. He's good. He's good being who he is. 
and yeah. I'm and he's got, anybody else. So I mean, the guy's got it. How many records has he played on? He's just oh, he's just a guy. It's just and, and that's the thing is, and he's a he's a he's just a really sweet guy. Like he's a really nice dude. So when we get together, it's not just guitar. Like when we get together, we just hang out. Like a lot, we spend half the time just talking. We'll just go sit, you know, in his backyard and just hang out or go get a sandwich, or, you know, just, just hang out. And then we'll spend time doing guitar playing, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. That's, that's, that's really cool. All right. Uh, give another minute here. Um, well, why, why are we waiting for maybe a last question or two to pop up? Just want to thank Steve so much for coming on the show. This is like, this is fantastic. You know, I I had my two favorite YouTube guys on instructional guys. I had it's Ian Stitch, by the way, who wanted me to pass on to you. Wanted to say hello, and actually, we wanted to to to, to contact you and see if you guys can maybe do something together. Oh, that's awesome! Well, yeah, that's nice. Super nice guy. He's based down in in, in Florida, so I'll, I'll I'll email you his his information. So if you guys uh, you know decide to do something, but um, yeah, I want to I want to thank. Um, I want to thank Steve so much for coming on. I want to thank all you folks for for tuning in today, man. We had we had over eighty people watching this show, so that's that's great. If you're new to the channel, folks, please hit the like button. Please subscribe. I've got links below uh, if you're interested in guitar hack merch. If you're interested in helping out the channel, there's a PayPal down there. There's a couple of things: my Facebook, my Instagram, my email, all that good stuff. So check that stuff out. And if for whatever reason, if you've not heard of Steve or his channel, I have his link below as well. I also have his link up in the cards. Well, okay, last well, few questions here, and then we're going to wrap this up. Uh, Martin LaBelle is asking, I know Steve was or still is in a Judas Priest cover band. We talked about that. Has he ever been in a Maiden cover band? I haven't. Um, I've got some really good friends that are in a band called Maiden Minneapolis. Um, I live in Florida, which is about three and a half hours from Minneapolis. And that's, I play in a lot of bands in Minneapolis just because there's a larger, you know, space to play different clubs, things like that. And uh, I've got a number of, I, I would do it in a heartbeat though, if I could find the time to do both the Judas Priest and the Iron Maiden and the other bands I've got too. But absolutely. See, those are the things. It's, it's not that being in a Judas Priest tribute band. And again, I don't dress up like anybody. We just play great tr Judas Priest stuff for two hours. Right. And that is invigorating it's so, so much fun yeah it's a, you know what do you, what do, you do? do you do you play the tipton parts or do you play the kk parts we, we just kind of decide we make sure that we've got uh, enough of both of us in every song so we don't really we don't really try and break it down that way we just yeah. listen and if a certain solo seems like it appeals to him more or me or whatever or like painkiller is a prime example where the, the solo is quite long right so break it into pieces or electric eye or something like that where we break it into pieces so we both can have fun going back and forth. Right, right. Okay, this will be the last question. This is from James Smith, who says, Hi, uh, hi, Guitar Hack. Hi, Steve. Got a question. Uh, if uh, I joined Guitar Zoom Song, if I join Guitar Zoom Song Club, do you yep. do song requests and will you transcribe for me? Well, what happens in the play, it's called play songs. That's the club. Um, what people do is they request songs. And then what I do is I go through each month and pick out the top five most requested songs. Right. And then those are the ones, um, that I make videos for among other songs that I do videos for, but I can't do every, every song request because I must, I probably get 400 song requests right, uh, right. a month. And so it's impossible to do them all. Um, but I, I try and get to the, the most popular ones as much as I can. So. All right, cool. Okay, Steve, hang on for a minute. So I want to thank everybody for, for checking out the show. You guys rock. Uh, we'll see you next week on the Hack Show where I'll have Howie Simon, who is a very well-known, Steve knows him, very well-known and respected uh, L.A. musician. He will be on with, with me next week. Also check out um, the Livewire show Monday at 9 o'clock because uh, I am part of the Livewire's crew now. So, so thanks a lot, folks. Have a great rest of your week. Have a great weekend. And we'll catch you soon. Cheers.